Ladies and gentlemen, herzlich willkommen, schön, dass Sie hier sind. Uh, today it's an extraordinary pleasure to introduce you um, Edward von Haut here at uh, Würzburg University. <coughs> Edward von Haut um, is director of research and publications as a center of scholarly and editing and document studies of the Royal Academy uh, of Dutch language and literature in Belgium, in Ghent. Uh, he's also a member of the Text Encoding Initiative Consortium and he was already within the TEI conference here at Würzburg University last year. That's a beautiful Toscana Saal <coughs> with some delicious <laughs> sweets. Um, uh, Edward is um, talking um, today about text image based digital humanities providing access to textual heritage um, in Flanders. And please feel free, ask your questions. There are no silly questions. Even if you are students, don't be shy, ask your questions. They are welcome. Please. Thank you very much. Um, you know, the hardest thing in uh, the film industry is the waiting. So I think we're ready. <laughs> I always have my crew with me when I'm on tour. Um, for the, the DVD afterwards, of course. All right. Um, what I'm going to do today is I give you an introduction in humanities computing and digital humanities. I know you're in the Department of Digital Humanities, but um, I think that uh, it can't harm to talk a little bit about the very early beginnings of humanities computing, or the use of computers for and in the humanities. That's my, uh, at the moment, my main part, main part of my research, to go back to the 40s and 30s and even, even in the, the 19th century, uh, and work out how it all came into being. So uh, I'm going to introduce you a bit in the, um, um, it's just a short overview of this, the, the early start of the humanities, of the use of computing in the humanities. We will talk a little bit about digital humanities and what it means, what the definition is of digital humanities. And then I will show you some projects uh, we do in Flanders, um, and I hope we'll have a discussion uh, then afterwards. So, uh, indeed, don't uh, don't be shy uh, if you want to ask me something. Just uh, yell and interrupt me, uh, and I, I don't bite, uh, except when I'm eating, of course. Um, I was watching a movie, uh, a documentary, the other day, and that's really, really literally the other day, uh, just two days ago. And that was a documentary about uh, Auguste Rodin, the famous French sculptor, and how he, um, it was a documentary about one of his main works, and the, the, the main work was the, um, the Gates of Hell. I don't know if you actually know that work uh, as a work, but I do know that you know bits of that work, but well, I'll come to that later. Um, in, 18, in 1897, um, Auguste Rodin was, um, was, was asked by the French Minister of Culture to make an entrance for a museum, the Museum of Fine Arts in Paris, which was going to be built. Uh, and he uh, got three years to actually make that entrance, the door, the main entrance door. Uh, but after three years, the plans of the museum uh, were disrupted and it all went out of hand and uh, the museum was never built. So after three years, uh, the French minister said to Auguste uh, Rodin, uh, you, know, you know, you did all this marvellous work on your models and your, your creations, but we're not, we're not going to build that, mu that museum, so we don't need your door anymore. And that was actually very good for Auguste Rodin, because he was an artist, he was not a door maker, he was an artist, he was trying to create something. And the moment he didn't have to make the door, the functional door anymore, he was freed from the setting of the door and he could make what he really wanted to make, namely a, a marvellous sculpture. It's six metres high, it's four metres wide. And this is, this is what, it, what, it, what it became. It's now the Rodin Museum in Paris. Um, it is a door, you see it's a door, but yet it's not a door because it doesn't open. There's no opening mechanism. Um, you see um, that, that some of the figures in the door are intertwined, are interlinked with the different panes, the different uh, the, the two leaves of the door, so it can't open, it, it's actually one solid block, but still 
it all stopped with the door, and because of failure, actually, failure of the building of the museum, Auguste Rodin was freed from this task of making a functional door and could actually make a marvelous sculpture out of it. Well, when I was, when I was watching this documentary and I was, I was thinking about this, this door and how it all, all, all went, and actually, this door actually was, was one of the main themes uh, in his work till, till he died. He, Constantly came back to the door, revisited it, and, and refined it, and, 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 and made new plans for it. Um, and I was thinking, well, actually, humanities computing, or the use of computers in the humanities, is very much like this door. There's two leaves, there's two door panes in it. Uh, there's the humanities part, and there's a the computing part. But we can't say which part is computing and which part is the humanities. Nowadays, it is one thing. Humanities computing, or later digital humanities, is a discipline uh, is, is one thing. And when somebody asks you, so what bit of your work is humanities and what bit of your work is the digital or is the computing, you can say, well, yeah, using the computer is a computing, but then you use the computer to do something, to create something, and that, that, that something, the result, is not humanities, it's not computing, it's not digital, it's digital humanities, it's humanities computing. So I thought this was a very good metaphor for, uh, for, what, for what we are doing. And uh, mostly the part of failure, the fact that Rodin actually created this big thing because the museum plans had failed, is, is, is also a metaphor for what we do in uh, humanities computing. Because failure in research is always the most interesting part of your research. You have a thesis, then you try to prove your thesis. When you've proved your thesis, it's not very exciting, but because you prove something which is already there, which you knew already. Only problem, the only advantage is that you have proof for what you thought was, was, was there. But when you have a thesis, you try to prove your thesis, and it doesn't work, then you have an interesting point. Why does it fail? Failure is always a very important point in research, and failure is a point where you start to generate meaning. But in humanities computing, failure was also very important. Actually, in the 1940s, the first computer, the first big computer, was commissioned by the Americans, by the Department uh, uh, for, for, for Defense, of course. They uh, commissioned a computer for ballistic research to calculate the fire tables in the war. Right. Um, the construction of the ENIAC, that's Electronic Numerical Integrator and Computer, you can forget about the name, but maybe when you read books about history of computing, you will, you will definitely uh, uh, recognize the acronym. Um, uh, the, the, the construction started in 1943, but it was, uh, it was fully operational in 1946. And if you know your history, you know in 1946 the war was over. Right. So actually the Americans had thought that the war was going to be a much longer process, uh, but the moment the computer which they had ordered to do all their ballistic research was finished and was operational, the war was, was finished. And they had a problem. Um, that was the second computer they uh, started to, to, to create, uh, and the first contracts for that were signed in 1945, and it was only fully operational in 1951. So way after the war had finished. Um, so there they were. Uh, there was a sort of failure. Uh, the, the very, very lucky end or very happy end of the war actually was a failure to the whole ballistic research process um, and, and the whole development of the computer. So there they were, the Americans and the Brits. They had this marvelous computer. And you can see that, that the, the computer was as large as this room. That was how what well a computer was. Um, so they had this, this binary and these decimal computers, and they didn't have any war anymore. So what could you do with it with a computer? That was a main problem. The computers were operational, but the war was over. And then there was um, uh, a very intelligent uh, uh, person who knew of the works of Ada Lovelace. Ada Lovelace it's actually, you can say, you know, uh, the father, a couple of people are, are named the father of modern computing, but there's also a mother of modern computing. And Ada Lovelace was uh, um, a lady, was a, she was a baroness actually, she was a woman 
in the 19th century, and she was experimenting a little bit with uh, the very first mechanical computers uh, built by, by Babbage. Um, and she theorized about it, and she, she didn't only see that with these uh, in integrators, it was called, you could do mathematical uh, uh, operations. But she wrote in a book, she wrote, well, there's, there's much more you can do with these uh, mechanical computers. Uh, it's, it's not only for crunching numbers, maybe you can also, you can only make music, also make music with them. Or you can also use them for social purposes or for humanities purposes. That's what she was talk, uh, thinking about. And Warren Weaver, who was in this, this defense department uh, during the war, um, he was confronted as director of the, uh, the, the, the science director of, of one of the departments of, 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 uh, of the US. Uh, he was confronted with this problem. We have big computers, but we don't have a war anymore. So what do we do with them? And he knew of the work of analogues and thought, well, maybe we could do something for humanities with these computers. We can do something for science. We can use them in the mathematics because calculating fire tables and doing ballistic research is actually a sort of applied mathematics. So we are going to use the computers for mathematics, uh, but we can also use them for humanities purposes. And the first thing which came to his mind was, of course, machine translation. In the war, he was working in a team which also did cryptanalysis and machine translation. You may be aware that uh, messages across all armies were, um, were, 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 were uh, encrypted. There was like a secret codes, right? And the other party. Uh, there, were, there were always people who tried to, uh, to uh, decipher the secret codes in order to know what the, what the message said. And if they knew what the message, message said before uh, the message or the task and the message was, 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 uh, was uh, carried out, then the enemy or the other party had an advantage over the others. You know, when, when there was like a code saying, next Thursday, plan an attack on this part of the country and they could read the, uh, the enemy or the other party could read the message on Wednesday, they could uh, make sure that they were there or they were not there and, uh, and, and, and make the whole operation uh, invalid. So um, um, Warren Weaver was in these uh, cryptanalysis departments or this cryptanalysis group and he said, well, now, now the war is over, we still need machine translation, we still need sort of cryptanalysis, but on a different level. There was the Cold War, right? The Americans needed to know what the Russians were up to. There was the whole challenge of going to the moon, right? The Russians were publishing uh, articles, science articles, and the Americans couldn't read Russian. Or they couldn't cope with all the information, with the whole, the whole uh, a lot of information which came from Russia. And they needed uh, uh, systems, computer systems, which could translate Russian into English. So they could actually get a grasp on all the information from you know, Russian, communist Russia, uh, and, 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 be, uh, and, and use that information in their own science. And vice versa, the Russians did the same. So they um, started to use computers for machine translation. And machine translation, um, um, that, that's what, what, what Warren Weaver did. Uh, there was also somebody else, that's Andrew Donald Booth, and that's a person uh, who's, who's mostly forgotten in the, in, the, in the history. Andrew Donald Booth, he was a Brit and he uh, migrated to Canada. He died in 2009. 